Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matthew Cumberlege. I'm the executive director of the Greene County Historical Society. I hope everyone's staying stay safe and healthy during the COVID-19 epidemic. And since we're all sort of stuck in our houses right now, I thought we could go for a drive and look at some different sites throughout Greene County and talk and learn a little bit about Greene County's early history. Right now, we're in Rich Hill Township, just a little beyond the town of Wind Ridge. And we're going to explore a few sites today, among which are going to be Crow's Rock and the site of the Corbley Massacre. I'd like to thank you for joining us and hope you all enjoy your time. Thank you. All right, we are down here in uh, Greensboro, Pennsylvania, right along the Monongahela River, which is running behind us there. And this is the old Greensboro Cemetery, actually one of the oldest burial grounds in the county. There's several Revolutionary War soldiers buried here. And unfortunately, over the years, this cemetery has seen quite a bit of vandalism. As you can see from many of these fallen down markers and lack of markers, this whole area is actually populated with graves. One of those graves is actually of great importance to Greene County, and it is right over here. John Miner was a captain in the PA militia, a uh, colonel in the Virginia militia. In fact, it was said that he was commissioned by Patrick Henry. Uh, John Miner is one of the earliest, if not the earliest settlers in Greene County. He was here as early as 1750, or I'm sorry, 1764 or 1765. He was from Winchester, Virginia, and probably in the uh, year 1764, he came up to this area from Virginia with a man named Jeremiah Glasgow. They scouted out some land, returned home, and brought their families back the following year. Uh, John is known as the father of Greene County because he was a uh, Pennsylvania legislator and actually initiated and pushed the bill through that got Greene County separated from Washington County on February 9th, 1796. Now, this is not John's original marker. His original marker, unfortunately, was a victim of the vandalism that happened here in decades past. But this was replaced several years ago uh, through the Department of the Veterans Affairs. And his original marker is now housed at the Greene County Historical Society on display for any of our visitors to see. All right, we are at the Greene County Historical Society and this is our featured artifact. This is the original grave marker for Colonel John Miner. And uh, unfortunately, as you can see that this is quite broken, uh, a large portion of this side is gone. And we had this replaced several years ago with a new marker through the Department of Veterans Affairs and uh, replaced it, recovered this one, and this one now is in the collection at the Greene County Historical Society. As we replaced this marker with the new one, we uh, made efforts to locate any of the missing pieces. Unfortunately, none of them were able to be found. Luckily, there was just enough of the uh, original inscription left that we could identify this as uh, John Miner's grave marker. So we were able to uh, maintain a marker on his original burial place, which is fantastic. Um, and this, we brought here so that it could be preserved as well as part of our history. On the second Sunday of May in the year 1782, being about to keep my appointment at one of the meeting houses about a mile from my dwelling, I set out with my dear wife and five children for public worship. Not suspecting any danger, I walked behind with my Bible in hand meditating. As I was thus employed, all of a sudden, I was greatly alarmed with the frightful shrieks of my dear wife before me. I immediately ran with all the speed I could, vainly hunting a club as I ran till I got within 40 rods of them. My poor wife seeing me cried to me to make my escape. An Indian ran up to shoot me. 
Seeing the odds too great against me, I fled and by doing so outran him. My wife had a chuckling child in her arms, the little infant they killed and scalped. Then they struck my wife several times, but not getting her down, the Indian who aimed to shoot me ran to her. My little boy, an only son about six years old, they sank a hatchet into his brain and thus dispatched him. A daughter besides the infant they killed and scalped. My oldest daughter, who is yet alive, was hid in a tree about 20 yards from where the rest were killed and saw the whole proceedings. She, seeing all the Indians go off as she thought, got up and deliberately came out from the hollow tree, but one of them spying her, ran hastily up, knocked her down, and scalped her. Also her only surviving sister, one on whose head they did not leave more than an inch round, either flesh or skin, besides taking a piece of her skull. She and the before-mentioned one are miraculously preserved, though as you must think. I, ha I have had and still have a good deal of trouble besides anxiety about them, in so much as I am, as to worldly circumstances almost ruined. I am yet in hopes of seeing them cured. They still, blessed by God, retain their senses notwithstanding the painful operations they have already had, and yet ma must pass through. Those are the words of the Reverend John Corbley that he wrote to a friend of his in Philadelphia two or three years after the attack on his family in 1782. We're at the Corbley Monument right now, which marks the spot, the approximate spot where this happened. And thank you for joining us. All right, we're here at the site of Crow's Rock. This is where on May 1st, 1791, the four Crow sisters were attacked by Indians right here in this very spot. They were visiting a sick friend and were strolling up Crow Creek here and their brother Michael passed them on horseback. And shortly thereafter, two Indians and a man named William Spicer who was captured during the attack on the Spicer family in 1774, came out of the woods and attacked the Crow sisters, killing three of them and one escaped. Uh, during the attack, the Crow girls hid behind this very rock. Originally, this rock was standing uh, at the base of the road and was moved up here to preserve it when they were putting dams on Wheeling Creek and they thought there was a potential this area could be flooded. This is one of the last massacres to happen in Greene County um, and as the end shows the end of a very sad time in our history. Welcome to the Greene County Historical Society. My name is Matthew Cumbridge. I'm the Executive Director. This is our new Artifact of the Month series. This month we are featuring the Iron from the Spicer Family Massacre. Many students of Greene County history may recall that the Spicer Massacre took place in June of 1774. In the early days of settlement in Greene County, Europeans and Native Americans existed peacefully. They often traded with each other, lived side by side. In fact, one was indistinguishable from the other. That began to change after the French and Indian War and culminated in the attack on Chief Logan's family. In June of 1774, a group of Indians attacked the Spicer family plot in Dunkard Township, Greene County. William the father was out cutting wood while Betsy was ironing clothes outside the cabin. The whole family was killed except for William Spicer Jr and Betsy, his older sister. During the attack, Betsy attempted to escape and she was carrying this very iron with her. As she ran, she threw the, the iron in the bushes near the cabin. Her brother William was captured also. Betsy and William were both released by treaty later on. However, William chose to remain with his captors. There are many theories as to what happened to William in his later years, yet that could be a story in and of itself. Betsy, after she was freed, returned home and found this iron in the bushes just where she had thrown it. This iron stayed in the Spicer family for many generations through their descendants, the Bowen family, and it was later donated to the Greene County Historical Society. This iron represents 
the tough times and struggles that our early settlers made when they lived here in the 1770s, 80s, and 90s. Indian attacks were quite common, and there are probably at least 10 to 20 reports just in Greene County alone. Thank you for joining us on this virtual driving tour of Greene County, Pennsylvania. We've hit some interesting historical sites, and hopefully we've created some new interest in the wonderful world that is Greene County history. We hope to continue making videos like this during the COVID-19 epidemic as we are not sure yet when we'll be able to open to visitors and begin conducting events again. Please keep an eye on our website and Facebook page for updates and more digital presentations. Thank you.